Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Heather Conley. I'm Senior Vice President here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies with the, the wonderful title of Europe, Eurasia, and the Arctic. I expressly wanted the Arctic in my title because it's one of the most interesting and dynamic areas of research here at the center. We, we are so delighted that you brave the cold. When I woke up this morning, I looked outside at my, the temperature at the thermometer and it said 15 degrees. And I thought, this is a perfect day to talk about the Arctic. So thank you for being with us. We are absolutely delighted uh, to welcome Foreign Minister Borga Brenda to join us today for what, I, what I'm saying is really our kickoff uh, for the center's Arctic activities and research as we gear up for the U.S. Chairmanship of the Arctic Council. And I see before us, and we're so delighted to have Admiral Robert Papp, U.S. Special Representative for the Arctic region here. And he is looking at his watch going only two more months to the Arctic Council Ministerial, where we, uh, from our Canadian colleagues, take over the chairmanship. So I thought, Minister, perfect timing for your visit here. We're very delighted that this conversation uh, that begins our, our research uh, into the U.S. chairmanship is done in cooperation uh, with the Norwegian Foreign Ministry uh, through a very generous grant. We'll be doing a two-year study on the U.S. chairmanship uh, with our sister think tank uh, institute, the Institute for Defense Studies in Oslo. So this really launches us in a new and a very exciting research project. So if we have perfect weather and perfect timing, clearly we have the perfect speaker to discuss the balance between Arctic economic opportunities and environmental stewardship. Prior to becoming Norwegian Foreign Minister in October of 2013, Minister Brende served as Minister of the Environment from 2001 to 2004, and then he served as the Minister of Trade and Industry from 2004 and 2005. His professional experience is achieving this balance between environmental stewardship and trade and investment. So, Norway's economy has been very much in the news of late, as Arctic economics in general, as the news of significantly lower global energy and commodity prices seem to challenge some of the fundamentals of business development in the Arctic. So we look forward to your remarks, Minister Brende, and our subsequent discussion on the Arctic. So if this is the perfect weather, perfect time, perfect speaker, a perfect moment to welcome Foreign Minister Brende, please join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, kind uh, introduction. Um, I definitely feel like home in this uh, weather. I was also in DC last week with uh, even colder weather that was so cold that it was even a bit cold uh, for a Norwegian. But it says something about uh, the changing uh, weather uh, patterns. Uh, Admiral Papp, uh, my friend, and uh, also the close uh, advisor of another friend, Secretary Kerry, that cares a lot about um, the Arctic uh, Council chairmanship uh, of the US. Uh, they're friends of the Arctic, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's a good opportunity to, uh, this afternoon uh, to discuss uh, the challenges and opportunities that we do uh, see in the Arctic. And, um, Coming out of uh, meetings on different uh, topics uh, this uh, morning, uh, I just have to uh, admit uh, that we are living in a rapidly changing world. As the geopolitical map is shifting, the international community is increasingly looking uh, to the east and to the south, and I would also maybe add the Middle East in that respect. At the same time, natural resources, uh, new trade routes, and increased human activity have provided new opportunities in the North, a new focus on the North. This has led to increased international interest in the region. In this rapidly changing world, our ability to respond adequately is tested time and again. However, what should not change 
are our common values and principles. I think last year really showed us that these uh, values should also, in the continuation, be our stable guiding light in this unstable world. They have guided us towards greater progress and justice in our search for security, prosperity, and development. Let us continue to uphold these values, democracy, human rights, the rule of law, trade, and cooperation. And this also applies for the Arctic. It is crucial that we make sure that they continue to do so. These values will be the guiding principles for uh, Arctic cooperation. The overall goal for Norwegian Arctic policy is to ensure that the Arctic remains an area of peace, stability, and international cooperation. No gold rush. It should be these principles that do guide us. And for Norway, the Arctic is of great importance. I don't need to uh, even underline that. As many of you know, 10% of Norway's population lives north of the Arctic Circle. 80% of our sea areas are located north of the Arctic Circle, 80%. As a nation of seafarers and fishermen, Norwegians have always lived off the sea. Polar exploration is an integral part of our national identity. I'm just coming from Sydney, Australia, where our king, His Majesty uh, King uh, Harold, had the first state visit to Australia. And uh, we have not only explored uh, in the Arctic, but also, you know, Rual Amundsen, uh, the first man to the South Pole uh, in 1911. So Antarctica is also part of the Norwegian identity. 80% of um, Arctic maritime traffic passes through Norwegian waters. Almost 90% of the Norwegian export revenues come from economic activity and resources in our sea areas. Our long coastline, traditions, and innovation go hand in hand. The US is also a leading Arctic nation with vital interests in the region's development, ranging from national security to economic development and environmental protection. The Arctic is not only relevant for Alaska, but also for other US states. I'm now stating the obvious to you, but um, it's in my manuscript. Fisheries are important for the state of Washington. There is important maritime activity in Maine, and there is crucial Arctic research uh, that are um, world leading uh, in the state of New Hampshire. Weather patterns, as we are seeing, are originating in the Arctic region, affect all states without exception. For Norway, the high north remains a key foreign policy priority of obvious region, uh, reasons. Peace, stability, and international cooperation are needed to ensure value creation and sustainable development in the Arctic. Successful international cooperation depends on a robust and predictable legal and institutional framework. This is clearly in place in the Arctic and is part of the reason why it has not turned into a gold rush. The law of the sea, UNCLOS, provides a legal framework for the sea areas with a firm basis in the UN. Although the US is not a signatory yet, it both respects and upholds the law of the sea. The Arctic Council, which has been strengthened over the last few years, is in this respect also crucial. The Arctic Council is producing groundbreaking reports about the Arctic. Its extensive work on climate change in the Arctic has been extremely important. The Arctic Council's reports have proven beyond doubt that climate change is taking place at a fast rate with serious and far-reaching consequences. New challenges have been met through the conclusion of legally binding agreements between the Arctic states. In these agreements, we have addressed important issues such as search and rescue, 
This has to be dealt with in a very uh, foresighted way in this very vulnerable environmental area. And marine oil pollution in the Arctic is another challenge that we know uh, uh, too well, also in the US. We welcome the US priorities for the forthcoming chairmanship period, outlined so eloquently by Secretary Kerry at um, uh, different occasions, but also by Admiral Papp that joined us at the Arctic Frontiers Conference that we had in Oslo in January. I know that we share the same interest and enthusiasm for the Arctic. We adhere to the same values and principles, the US and Norway. I can assure you that we will do our part to make the next chairmanship period a success. The Arctic Council is an excellent example of regional cooperation. The Arctic states have shown that they are able to find new solutions in response to new challenges. This also goes for Norway's neighbor, Russia. We have a long history of constructive neighborly cooperation. Russia's violations of international law in Ukraine have, however, affected our relations. Norway has implemented the same sanctions against Russia as the EU, and also US has done uh, its part. We have also suspended our military cooperation uh, in um, uh, a number of uh, areas. Nevertheless, it is important for us uh, to continue to cooperate with Russia on important issues such as search and rescue, the management of uh, fish stocks, environmental protection, nuclear safety, maritime safety, and Coast Guard and Border Guard activities. We are neighbors and sharing the Boring Sea. So this is uh, quite obvious. It is of great benefit to the Arctic states that non-Arctic states are also showing increased interest in the region. Norway welcomed the decision to admit new observers to the Arctic Council at uh, 2013 ministerial, at which the Arctic family was extended to include Asian countries. The Arctic has become an arena for cooperation between Europe, North America, and Asia. This is a new and very interesting development. It presents us with new opportunities. In order to meet uh, the increased international interest in the Arctic, we need robust regional development in the North, based on knowledge and innovation. The Arctic is not a homogeneous region. Because of the North Atlantic current, temperature and ice conditions in the mostly ice-free Norwegian part of the Arctic are vastly different from other parts of the Arctic. Climatic conditions and the amount of human activity vary greatly across the region. Norway is um, mostly um, ice-free, uh, and this is due uh, to uh, the Atlantic current. At the same time, the Arctic uh, states also share many of the same challenges, even if there are differences. And this reinforces the need for cooperation and knowledge sharing between peoples of the North. The Norwegian Arctic is experiencing a higher level of economic growth than the rest of Norway. That may be come as a surprise, but this region is expecting a 6 to 7% economic growth in the coming year, and Norway, on average, more like 3%. The Norwegian government aims to promote sustainable business development in the north. The region has always been a stronghold of traditional knowledge, gained from indigenous people's experience of living close to the nature, and all the fishermen, and also seafarers that do live in this very active part of our country. What it is different from many other parts of the Arctic is that um, we have a long history in the Arctic of people uh, ling living out of the sea and uh, also uh, utilizing the marine resources. This is part of our history, but it's also a very important part of the identity of the people in the northern part of Norway. 
We want to build on existing experience and expertise when developing scientific institutions and cooperation in North Norway. The number of doctorates completed in the Arctic and focusing on the Arctic has doubled in recent years. We have strengthened um, our uh, higher education institutions in the north and also the Arctic um, University of uh, Tromsø has developed um, in a, a very, um, a very um, a productive way. The Arctic Council uh, should also, in the years to come, cooperate with the business sector. We warmly welcome the establishment of the Arctic Economic Council uh, that sets also uh, some standards for uh, business in the North. In order to secure sustainable economic growth uh, in the North, responsible resource management is key. We must make sure that both new and traditional industries can live side by side. In other words, the fisheries sector and oil and gas activities must be able to coexist. I understand that this, is, this discussion is also very relevant for Alaska. Norway takes an ecosystem and science-based approach to resource management in the Arctic. And it is interesting to see that this kind of coabition, this coexisting um, businesses of fisheries and oil and gas and other activities in the north have been possible. Back in the 70s, um, it was said that oil and gas activities would uh, be devastating uh, for uh, the marine uh, harvesting and the, and the fisheries sector. We have tried to prove differently by setting the highest standards environmentally for oil and gas activities. And I have to admit that I think we have been uh, relatively successful in this respect. And you can't uh, fool the numbers. In 2013, the cod quota in the Barents Sea was at a record high of 1 million tons with an export value of more than US dollars, one billion. From 2013 to 2014, the export value of Norwegian cod and cod species increased by 20%. We've never been in a situation where we could have harvested so much Arctic cod out of the Barents Sea than we do last year and I think also this year. This was also quite a tough fight for the one of us that already were active in politics in the 80s. There were demonstrations and very, very uh, tough arguments from the fishermen in the north saying that uh, the politicians were listening more to the scientists than the real people of the north. But we did comply every year with advice from the scientists. And today, you can find no fishermen in the north in the north saying that this was not the wise decision. As long as you base it on the scientific advice, you will also in uh, the future be much better off. And sometimes in politics, being a politician means that you have to say no, because you know that that is the right thing. And maybe you will not have see the yield in the first year, second year. Maybe you will see it in a decade or two. But that is what leadership is about, not um, buying into all short-term uh, interests. That doesn't only apply for the Arctic. Um, <laughs> this is due, so, um, so coming back to the, it was the, the quota of cod, wasn't it? Um, why it has developed uh, so well uh, is due to the sound management um, of fish stocks in the Barents Sea. Then turning into oil and gas. It has previously been estimated that about 20% um, of the world's undiscovered oil and gas resources are to be found in the Arctic. According to the International Energy Agency that you are all well aware of, the global demand for energy will increase by 35 to 40% over the next 20 years. As other parts of the Arctic become more accessible, we will be able to produce more energy also from the region. And how are we going to deal with this? 
Oil and gas will continue to be significant in the global energy mix, and the share of renewable energy is set to increase. We need to move from a fossil-based fossil uh, society into a low-carbon society. But as a bridge there, I believe that natural gas can play a major role, especially in a situation where we see the amount of coal being consumed in the world is increasing, and natural gas emitting half of what coal resources do. There have been oil and gas activities in the Norwegian Arctic for decades. The Norwegian oil and gas sector sets the strictest environmental and security standards in the world, and it is increasing its activities in the Barents Sea. At the same time, the Arctic is severely affected by climate change. So there are dilemmas also in politics, as we know. In the long term, the fate of the Arctic environment and the, peace of global, uh, and the pace of global climate change depend on our collective efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Over the last 100 years, temperatures in the Arctic have been rising twice as fast as the global average. In September 2012, the extent, the extent of the Arctic sea ice was at a record low. The Arctic Ocean will probably become virtually ice-free in this century. Over the last two decades, the Arctic ice sheets have been losing mass. Almost all glaciers worldwide have continued to shrink, according to IPCC's uh, fifth assessment report. We know that what happens in the Arctic will not stay in the Arctic. The global effects of the climate change observed in the Arctic are serious. As the Arctic warms, monsoon weather patterns will probably change. The melting of polar ice will cause rising sea levels globally and accelerate global warming. The changes taking place in the Arctic are a call for action. They should give momentum to the international negotiations. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud of the fact that the Arctic states have risen uh, to the new challenges in the region and have increased their cooperation. We have worked together in areas such as resource management, climate change, and the environment. We will continue to work together. We look forward to strengthening our cooperation with the US, both within the Arctic Council and bilaterally. As we move forward in the Arctic, we must be guided by knowledge, responsibility, international cooperation, and respect for universal values and principles. Thank you. Mr. Minister, thank you very much. That was a great tour de force, and that's a lot of cod. That's all thank I you. can say. Yeah, so yeah. congratulations on, on that. And I was sticking to the time. You huh? were perfectly timed, perfectly timed. Uh, I had to cut off the manuscript. But oh, <laughs> a speechwriter is very sad somewhere. Um, but uh, what I thought we'd do, we have about 35 minutes. We will. I thought we'd moderate, have a little discussion here for a few minutes, uh, let our audience begin to gather their questions and then unleash them. I will warn you that CSIS audiences are very good and they ask very tough questions, so I will uh, uh, get you ready for that. But let me... And you want to expose me for that? I do, yeah. I do. You, you gotta, you're going to be working pretty hard the next 35 minutes. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one, and, and thank you for your comments on Russia. Today, Russian Defense Minister Shoigu had the following quote. He said, threats to our national security are being formed now in the Arctic. We must uh, uh, develop our military infrastructure to defend our priorities. That's not necessarily that statement conducive with high north low tensions. Um, we've seen an extraordinary amount of new military modernization focusing on Russia's northern fleet, the strategic nuclear deterrent, as well as their, what they need to do for the Coast Guard and their search and rescue centers along the northern sea route. Are you growing concerned that we're seeing a new situation developing? What should we look out for? It's a very good question. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, as I said, there is a new security environment in Europe. Uh, who would have believed a year ago that one European country should just then take a piece of another European country where there had no, have been no border disputes? It's not like uh, Russia for two decades have claimed that part of Ukraine was, uh, was Russian. Quite the contrary, uh, through the Budapest Memorandum, uh, they uh, just approved of the borders um, of Ukraine. We cannot be uh, naive about this, and that's why also we have all agreed uh, on the sanctions. We need to respond to this uh, blatant breach of international law. Then there is a fact that um, in the last four years, Russia has increased its defense expenditures with more than 60% in four years. NATO has, in the last five years, reduced its budget with 20%. That delta is not sustainable and cannot continue. We, we need to have um, military that is adequately uh, prepared for a new security situation. That's why we are increasing our budgets. Norway, uh, Turkey, and Poland, it's the only three NATO countries that have not been cutting our defense budget the last uh, five years. Uh, we will make major investments, and more than 20% of our budget uh, to defense is also allocated to investments. We know that the Russians are now allocating, I think, uh, 60% of their, I just have to check if I'm <laughs> using the right numbers, 60% uh, of their budget to investments. It is, it is a, a striking, uh, it is a striking number. We have also seen that there is a new kind of, um, uh, in this new security landscape, we see this notion of hybrid warfare, asymmetric warfare. So we have also to prepare ourselves for a different security uh, landscape in the sense that we just have to be aware that uh, it is not necessarily uh, traditional uh, military activity, but there can be propaganda, there can also be incidents uh, that um, are uh, being uh, developed. I, I will not go uh, more into the details here, but we can just uh, imagine. What we're seeing in Donbass now, if that took place in another place, uh, what, what, how are we ready to cope with that? Have we mentally prepared ourselves for that? In the Baltic Sea, we have seen increased military activity from the Russians, and this has to be taken seriously. So far, in the Barents Sea and in the Arctic, we have not seen uh, this increased tension so far. The capability of increasing activities in the north is there, hence uh, the increased uh, budget and the military capabilities. So we hope that it will not uh, see, we will not um, be witnessing a deterioration in the Arctic. Uh, that's what we also urge uh, the Russians. That's why the collaboration in the Arctic Council, also under uh, US leadership now, is so crucial. There were forces saying that, oh, we should also expel or not have uh, the Russians part of the Arctic Council. My response to that was that would be a very silly idea. Russia is 60% of the Arctic. Uh, we should engage Russia. We should use that opportunities to be clear about uh, breaking international law and all this. But I'm glad that the US is also clear on integrating and having Russia as a part of the Arctic world. Sorry for a very long no, answer, no. but it is one of the crucial questions now moving forward. No, I'm, I'm so glad. Thank you. It's a great great and comprehensive response. I'm wondering, should we see increased activities, security-related activities in the Arctic? Um, Admiral Stavides uh, wrote an article in Foreign Policy uh, the other day suggesting, he was suggesting that perhaps an Arctic treaty was required. I think I'd love your 
a thought on that since that, that issue was put to rest in 2008, uh, the Uliuset uh, Declaration. But do you see a need for enhanced confidence building measures in the Arctic? He suggests a code of conduct that if we do see, I mean, I, quite frankly, there are there is some concern about air sovereignty. We just had two Russian uh, fighters uh, near Iceland, Norway, Norwegian coast has experienced uh, quite a bit of uh, additional air <laughs> challenges, if you will, air sovereignty challenges. Do you think we should start thinking about strengthening confidence building uh, in the Arctic? Or complying with the current yes. treaties and that would be national good law would be a good start. Yeah. Uh, but when it comes to the law of the sea, um, my experience is that this is also in the interest of Russia to comply with that. The law of the sea uh, is instrumental when it comes uh, to the Arctic. So uh, continuation in complying with that is crucial. And uh, for Norway's uh, part, we have a long experience with handling Russia as our uh, neighbor uh, during also the Cold War, but we also always had the basis in NATO since 1949. And we always done what we think is right for our country and for our sovereignty. Uh, in close uh, collaboration with our allies, and we will continue to do so. So I'm, I, I have to um, admit that I'm not, I, I'm not very, um, I'm not sh very concerned about uh, the Arctic uh, and uh, Norwegian sovereignty uh, in the north. But I'm not naive about it in the sense that we also need uh, to have. Um, a strong uh, military presence, and the best investment uh, in security and peace in the future is that we uh, can match what we're seeing uh, from the East. And Norway has not a contracting economy of 4 to 5%. We are fortunately not in a situation where there is zero FDI coming in. We are not uh, fortunately in the situation where all um, investments and capital flows out of Norway, uh, and nothing uh, is being invested in Norway. So I'm pretty sure uh, that with our great friends here, great friend, our closest ally here in, in DC with no um, quite a robust economic uh, development, if what is asked for is um, a military buildup that we have not asked for and we have no, uh, we, we, we don't want this we, we don't want this, but I, I can guarantee our, our Russian friends, and I also uh, told my colleague, Sergei Lavrov, um, if that is the case, uh, we, will, uh, we will match it. Yeah. Yeah. Let me turn uh, to another emerging power in the Arctic, China. And you mentioned in your remarks, um, China is now coming up on two years of being an observer uh, in the Arctic Council just uh, completing its second icebreaker, non-nuclear icebreaker, its second uh, scientific center uh, in the Arctic after its center in Svalbard in um, nor uh, northern Iceland. Beijing-Oslo relations have been very difficult. How is the bilateral relationship and how are you finding China uh, uh, through the Arctic Council mechanisms? I'd just love your, your expand your thoughts a little bit on China's emerging role in the Arctic? So uh, what kind of bilateral relations? <laughs> um, no, it, it is a fact that uh, since uh, the Nobel um, Committee in 2010 um, decided uh, on uh, Li Shabo uh, as uh, a Nobel laureate, uh, the bilateral relations between uh, China and Norway uh, has uh, been in the fridge. Uh, or has been, um, been um, um, very limited. Not from our side. We, we, we want to normalize our relationship, and I, I'm pretty sure that will also uh, take place uh, in the future, but uh, th that it will happen. But Norway uh, will always, in our foreign policy, base it on our values, and... Um, also on uh, Norwegian 
uh, principles, and um, I'm pretty sure that China is, is doing the same. We do have a collaboration with, uh, with China when it comes to science. Also, there are a lot of uh, Norwegian investments in China and Chinese investments uh, in Norway. But on the political level, uh, it has been uh, extremely limited uh, since 2010. Uh, we voted uh, in favor, supported uh, a Chinese op um, uh, status of uh, being an observatory uh, to uh, the Arctic uh, Council. And uh, I think that shows the Norwegian uh, spirit. We have no grudges, and uh, I think China will uh, play an important role um, in the Arctic uh, in the years to come. There are other observers that are knocking on the door, and in fact, at the Arctic Council Ministerial in April, there'll be other members, uh, Switzerland, Mongolia, Turkey. What are your thoughts as this Arctic Council table continues to expand? Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? We did a major uh, enlargement when it comes to observers um, uh, just recently, as, as you underlined. So let us now reflect on mm. how much uh, the Arctic Council uh, can chew at the same time and um, see if the time is ripe now uh, to also admit um, uh, additional uh, observers. I think we need to have some time uh, discussing uh, this. We should not lose um, uh, the picture of the most, um, the, the most pressing issues uh, are uh, what I outlined in my, my speech, and we just have to find the right policy uh, to this. So, uh, so the, um, the answer to this is that we are, we are reflecting on this. Wonderful. One last question, and then I'll turn, uh, turn to our audience. I, I wonder if you believe this statement is true. I am detecting that we are developing an Arctic diplomacy. So I'm seeing Arctic states at the International Maritime Organization. I'm hearing about meetings on the margins of the Paris COP21, that there's a sense of, there's an Arctic diplomacy where we need to push in other multilateral fora. Arctic states are taking positions. And I, is, this, is this a trend or, or are we seeing something new here? And I'd welcome your thoughts on watching how Arctic states and those who support the vision uh, interacting in other multilateral organizations to benefit the Arctic. No, it's a, it's a very um, good observation. And I believe there is a potential, both in the run-up to COP21 uh, uh, in Paris, also in IMO, for example, for um, when we discussed the polar code uh, for the maritime uh, sector, we cannot accept any kind of vessel uh, floating around uh, in the Arctic with the devastating results. If there is, a, is an accident, we can just look to Alaska and see what that can um, uh, lead to. And I hope that what we're seeing of increased tension between the East and, and, and the West will not uh, be brought into the Arctic. So we can find common ground on um, issues that brings us together. And uh, maybe that can also be then followed up in other international um, for us and uh, also in the multilateral um, setting. Th this will be very interesting to absorb in uh, Iqaluit uh, in a couple of, uh, of months uh, to see if that spirit of cooperation can be ma maintained. Uh, in uh, the Arctic Council. And from Norway's side, that is our clear, clear um, objective. Wonderful. All right. I'm sure I've given you a lot of time to think up some good questions. Uh, what I'd like you to do, we're going to bundle some questions, Minister, if that's OK. If you could identify yourself, your affiliation. We like our comments short and our questions crisp. So with that, uh, I see lots of hands in the center. Chloe, there we go. Chloe, we'll start there, please, and then we'll just pass it across. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister Brenda. My name is Jerry Leap. I'm chair of the board of the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, which represents all of the global NGOs that work on Antarctic issues. But we're also concerned about the Arctic and we wanted to thank you for your comments. 
and your continued and Norway's continued support of science and conservation in the in the Arctic, and especially important as the U.S. is looking forward to its chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Um, but we also wanted to appreciate your Norway's continued commitment to the Antarctic through the most recent visit of the King to Antarctica, which we were quite gratified to see, and look forward to the continued support of Norway for the MPA proposals in the Antarctic, in the Ross Sea, and also the East Antarctic. And so, um, but also your leadership in the krill fishery, where, where one of your companies has been a real leader in prosecution of it. My question here is, you've been thinking, as we all have, a lot about China and Russia. And I was wondering if you had any insights as to whether we could anticipate any uh, change in their uh, from their position of opposition to these proposals from last year when the, uh, can, the, when the Antarctic treaties meet uh, this fall. Thank you. Thank you. We'll just take that microphone right across the way. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your comments. Uh, Jill Blockus, I'm with the Nature Conservancy, a large environmental uh, nonprofit. And I have two questions uh, specific to Norwegian's, well, Norway's great leadership globally, um, in particular on climate change, not just in terms of massive funding that we've seen for RED, the reduced um, emissions in deforestation and, and, uh, and uh, also a support for the Green Climate Fund and, and uh, support in, in leadership um, most recently is as mentioned uh, in the white paper announcement in early February when Prime Minister Solberg put forth the new emission reductions uh, looking at at least 40% um, by 2030, which was a more ambitious target than even the extremely ambitious target. How does that hit down in the Arctic is the first question. The second, referring to your comments on ex exemplary conduct in oil and gas, uh, work in, in the Arctic in particular, I know for a fact that Norway's had a very strong oil for development program and training in Stavanger and other places uh, hosted through NORAD and energy uh, departments. So there is cooperation elsewhere. Could there potentially be cooperation through the Arctic Council for showing best code of conduct and best practice, uh, particularly with oil and gas development vis-a-vis -vis fisheries and other resource management? Thank you. Do you want to take those two? Thank you. Um, I, I'm impressed by um, uh, all the detailed knowledge about uh, also our positions and uh, policies. Um, very impressive. Um, on uh, climate change, this is uh, one of our uh, five main priorities in our foreign uh, policy and development policy. Uh, being responsible for the development policy of uh, Norway as the foreign minister, we um, like to um, focus on all the different mechanisms that you also mentioned, uh, stopping uh, deforestation uh, when it comes to rainforest, lowing, lowest hang hanging uh, fruit, very cost effective, important, but also important for biodiversity, the climate fund, uh, but also being partner of the EU bubble, but with the aim of reducing with 40%. All this also applies for our activities uh, in uh, the Arctic. And we will uh, not make compromises when it comes to the highest, uh, uh, highest um, environmental standards when it comes uh, to the Arctic. That also uh, applies for the oil and gas uh, sector. Uh, this is crucial. It is uh, very crucial. Oil for development, as you mentioned, is the program that we have developed where we do capacity building in uh, developing countries that are uh, starting to uh, develop oil and gas, especially offshore. Um, uh, we collaborate with uh, Mozambique, Tanzania, um, also with countries like Angola that has, is, is more uh, developed. It's not only on um, environmental standards, but it's also related to um, uh, governance, and making sure that uh, governmental rent uh, goes to the people and uh, not to those that uh, are not supposed to. Uh, have access uh, to this funding. On Antarctica, I can um, uh, also share with you that we will present the first white paper to the parliament in the course of the spring. Um, I will present this uh, hopefully in, in May, June. Um, 
we are supportive of uh, maritime protected areas uh, in Antarctica, as you uh, mentioned, and we will continue to do so. We're also very uh, focused uh, on the fact that um, marine resources in um, uh, Antarctica uh, needs to be based on scientific uh, advice and scientific uh, recommendations. When it comes to krill, that uh, is very important that we get more knowledge about the situation on, um, for the krill. Uh, we don't have uh, as much update on uh, the recent, uh, recently uh, on the amount of krill uh, in uh, Antarctica. And if we're going to harvest krill that I'm in favor of, it has to be done in a way that we know it's sustainable and we are not um, uh, repeating um, mistakes uh, in that region uh, from um, previous times, for example, when it comes to, uh, to, uh, to whaling. When it comes then to uh, China and uh, Russia uh, and how they will uh, deal with Antarctica uh, in the future, um, we just hope, my, my hope is that they will uh, be constructive partners in making sure that Antarctica and their areas around will be uh, the best concerned wilderness area uh, in the world. Onshore, if you can talk about onshore, uh, it is onshore, but you know, it's a lot of ice there too, uh, fortunately. It needs, we hope that everyone will comply with the Antarctic uh, Treaty, peaceful, uh, no uh, use and extraction of minerals uh, onshore uh, in Antarctica uh, for the coming uh, decades. This is a unique a treaty that we would like uh, to preserve, but utilizing the marine resources around in a sustainable way. Certainly one of, I think, one of the most ambitious elements of the U.S. Uh, agenda for the Arctic Council is the creation of marine protected areas and perhaps even going so far as a regional seas agreement for the Arctic. Um, we see some parallels, obviously, with the MPA uh, in the Ross Sea area. What, uh, do you think that's something that can be achieved in the next two years? I mean, the groundwork is being laid, but uh, what, what are your thoughts on that ambition of particularly a regional seas agreement? I, I, I'm, I want to go back to my, my speech where I also said that there are, uh, the Arctic is not homogeneous. If you look to Iceland, we have the former prime minister and ambassador uh, here, you know that the Icelandic people, 250, 300,000? Sorry, oh. <laughs> that's 330,000 um, uh, rely on uh, the sea and the, the marine resources. As I said, uh, in Norway, 10% of our population is about uh, the Arctic Circle. And utilizing and living out of the sea is not something that we started with um, 100 years ago. This is the history of Norway. You know, the, the word Norway is the way north. That is the meaning of the whole country, the, the, the name of the country. So for us saying that, oh, we should now establish an area that we will protect, uh, protect because it's someone waving with a flag in um, somewhere in France or something, that's not our approach. Uh, our approach is that it should be ecosystem-based, and you have to look at the different activities and see if it adds up to something that is sustainable. Um, we will continue uh, with fisheries. We will continue um, to also have activities in the north. We have indigenous peoples that have been um, uh, relying on reindeers and harvesting for uh, thousands of years. So this is part of our history. So we can also um, and we have established areas where we have protected cold uh, coral uh, reefs, for example, as Minister of Environment, I was the first one that ever initiated um, protection of cold uh, coral reefs. Um, that was uh, a sound thing to do. But seeing an area of vast area close to where people have their living uh, protected and they cannot utilize the resources, it's not the Norwegian angle. The Norwegian angle is sustainable development based on the highest environmental standards. So maybe we'll uh, have interesting discussions on this <laughs> to moving <be> forward. <laughs> to con but I, I, I like to be candid about yeah. it. No, I'm so grateful. Thank you. I think we can take a few more questions. 
side. The, yes, we have one in the back. So there's a microphone right behind you. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, uh, Sean Carberry, freelance uh, journalist based in DC. Can you talk about the status of territorial claims in the Arctic and how that process is going, what you feel are the, the concerns of that process, and is the Arctic Council uh, able to play any role in, in mediating the territorial claims? I'm so glad you asked that. That's probably the one question as an analyst I get uh, the most when uh, Canada submits a claim, Russia submits a claim, Denmark is submitting a claim over the Lomonsov. Oh my goodness, what does this mean? So I'm delighted that you're going to answer this question for us. You're going to bundle them, you said. I, well, I was going to bundle, but this one's so good. Take yeah. it away. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no bundling, go for it. <laughs> so um, as I also addressed in my, in my speech, we have uh, been in the lucky uh, and fortunate situation uh, in the Arctic that um, also territorial claims will be based on the law of the sea. And um, this should also uh, be uh, the guiding principle uh, moving forward. Um, you know that Norway and Russia had um, quite a vast area where we had a, a dispute going on for decades, the gray zone, and we were able to find um, a solution uh, back in 2010, uh, and uh, this was inspired uh, by also the spirit of the law of the sea. So um, I'm uh, quite optimistic that we, in the years to come, also will uh, find uh, solutions to these uh, different territorial claims based on the principles uh, in the law of the sea. I'd like to pull, you mentioned the Arctic Economic Council, um, and this is a very new innovation under the Canadian chairmanship. Uh, it's just getting started, but what are your aspirations for the Arctic Economic Council, and, and how do you think it will relate in a larger measure to the Arctic Council? As a foreign minister, how, would you, how will you use the Arctic Economic Council as a tool for your own understanding of, of Arctic development in a larger way? This is also um, up to uh, the business sector uh, to use this Arctic Economic Council um, for um, the purposes they uh, feel uh, is um, useful and, uh, and it is a coordination uh, forum uh, for business development in the Arctic but it potentially also can set some standards that the businesses and the companies can agree on uh, uh, for themselves. We have seen in, in this um, business sector that companies and the private sector uh, also on environmental issues, but corporate social responsibility has been really pushing the envelope uh, globally. Sometimes the, the private sector has been push, push, pushing the politicians and not the opposite. We know that on climate change, we know that from G8. Um, what I feel uh, is uh, the potential of this Arctic Business Council is that you will have increased collaboration between companies uh, that are uh, major operators in the Arctic. And it can create new jobs. It can also uh, create new bonds and opportunities um, in this uh, part of the world. It's certainly an exciting development. We'll look forward to watching that as we go. I, I have one more question I have to ask, but I want to just scan the horizon here to make sure we have any more questions. So my, my final question before we close out, um, we will do some events and have some conversations as we get closer and closer to Akalawit, to the Arctic Council Ministerial. Um, what, what, what are you hoping comes out of the Iqaluit Ministerial, and if you could project, what would you like to see coming out of the U.S. chairmanship as, as we conclude in 2017? Can I defer to Admiral Pan? No, you may not. No. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have him back, and he can ask that question. You're I'll a, ask him the same question know, in about two you, months. Uh, yeah, you're, you're a great <laughs> MC. Uh, oh. <laughs> Sorry, no, that's a tough no, 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 no. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's a great question. I, I have high hopes. Uh, for the U.S. Uh, chairmanship. I know that Secretary Kerry 
uh, is really uh, personally involved in this. Uh, I will see him uh, tomorrow, and part of our conversation will be about the U.S. Uh, chairmanship. I know he cares a lot about climate um, and the environment. Uh, he is the ocean guy. And the oceans, yeah. He is the ocean guy. And um, we have some of the cleanest and most resource, um, we have the cleanest and also um, oceans with a lot of resources intact uh, in the Arctic. And that should also be the aspiration uh, moving forward. I know that the US has been focusing a lot of, uh, on the challenges of uh, acidification. Mm -hmm. This is something that we are extremely concerned about. What are uh, the medium long-term impact for the oceans uh, due to the acidification? These are uh, marine, uh, the marine resources are vast, incredible, staggering and we don't know the impacts of climate change on these resources. We, we know them for polar bears and et cetera. They are devastating, but I think we are also seeing uh, great challenges uh, to these rich um, oceans. Short-lived uh, climate um, uh, gases um, is, is something that I know is on the agenda on the U.S. Uh, side. Uh, that's also um, has the full uh, priority from my side. When we talk about climate change as one, maybe the most challenging um, issue of this century, we also need to really go for uh, the lowest hanging fruits where we can have impact immediately. That's why we've been so engaged in the rainforest as if we can stop the illegal logging and the logging of the rainforest that has a lot to say um, for a, in a situation where we have to build this bridge I was talking about from a fossil fuel-based society to um, low carbon society. But that, the short-lived uh, climate emission, uh, climate gases, um, is also part of that, um, uh, that uh, equation. Then uh, keeping um, the Arctic uh, as a peaceful uh, place for collaboration will be something very important. And I, I look forward to US uh, diplomacy in making sure that we are not uh, then uh, making the Arctic Council into uh, the same kind of um, uh, of a place where uh, aggression and uh, differences uh, coming out of other places uh, will, um, will, will then uh, have a negative uh, influence. That will be an um, art of uh, diplomacy. I know uh, Admiral Papp uh, went to Moscow, uh, did a great job uh, there. Uh, so um, these are some of the aspirations and, and and some of the challenges um, in the preparation for, for Ecalvet. Well, that is a great way to, to conclude with those, those aspirations. I think they're important. Rare is the opportunity that we speak with such a senior official where we can go from the Arctic to the Antarctic to Russia to China. We have been around the world a couple of times, and it's been a very informed and intellectually rich conversation. Please join me in thanking Foreign Minister Blender. Thank you. Thank you.